I have a uh, i800 and uh, i600 also, and uh, I work with this since uh, maybe uh, one and a half year. So what I will do is give you some new tips, maybe some you know, some you don't know about ankle sonography and about the ligaments and tendons in the ankle, in the ankle and also one nerve that we will see. So uh, we'll speak about ligaments, sprains, tendons, and the tendon rupture, peroneal tendons, uh, the, the rupture, the cleft dislocation, and the clicks. I will show you some videos about that. But first of all, the main question that radiologists have uh, in their clinics uh, is, do we need to do ultrasound in ankle sprain? So this is very important to know that the answer is clearly no, because the vast majority of the ankle sprains will uh, heal completely without any, uh, any treatment or with a light treatment like uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, crutches or even nothing. 80% of the ankle sprain will heal without any uh, problem within three weeks. So the treatment is usually always the same, but depending on local habits, going from nothing to a plastic cast, there are very good criteria worldwide validated to decide if any complementary examination is needed. These criteria are called the Ottawa criteria, and you can find it in the literature everywhere. It's coming from uh, emergency medicine in Ottawa, Canada, and they can exclude very easily significant fracture or significant significant lesions in the ligaments with avulsion of bone. So the ankle sprain is a ligamentous lesion with or without bony involvement. And ultrasound is able to diagnose ligament tears in the ankle, yes, almost all except the posterior talofibular and the posterior tibiofibular ligaments, which, is, which are not very important because they are always uh, injured after uh, other uh, li ligament uh, tears. So it cannot see uh, neither the intraosseous talocalcanear ligament, which is part of the subtalar joint. This is a little bit more important, and we'll see that it can give you uh, some problems. They cannot see very easily the medial and the inferior plantar parts of the spring ligament. This is also something that can be uh, difficult for ultrasound and seen with other modalities. And the tibio-navicular ligament is also a little bit dif difficult to see. See, this ligament uh, uh, is a part of the deltoid ligament. I will show you in the demonstration where we have to look for it. But sometimes it's very difficult to see. So ultrasound is it is able to diagnose bony avulsions or fracture? Yes, this has been shown in another uh, paper from Emergency Medicine Journal, except of the Thaler Dome, and this is the most important limitation of ultrasound and the most important thing that you have to think about when an ankle uh, sprain doesn't heal, still is painful uh, after three, four, six weeks after the injury. So always think that we cannot see this and this this can be very important to have a diagnosis of this, and you, can, you must uh, go to MRI in these cases. This is how you look to the ATFL. Uh, nowadays, this is the ATFL, a little bit uh, lax, as you see. This is not a very normal ATFL. It is a little bit elongated. This is what you can see after an ATFL lesion. So some weeks after, it is healed, but a little bit laxed, a little bit elongated. On the, up, on, the side, on the other side, the healing process of the ATFL can, uh, can uh, give you an image of a thickened ATFL. So this can be a reason why you have instability of the, of the ankle, and we'll see how to look for instability in a, f in a few moments. And this can be a reason why you have still pain in the ankle when you do an eversion. So eversion, you are just putting together your talus and your fibula. And of course, this is a part of the, of the ligament which is uh, much thicker than normal, which can be very painful when the fibula is going towards the talus in eversion. So think about that when a patient is coming to you and says, I have pain when I put my, my foot like this, 
Think of the thickened ATFL, the thickened healed ATFL. When he's coming to you and tells you that he has instability, he, th he, he thinks that he can have other sprains, think about elongated ATFL. So you can see here the you can see here the, 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 the acute lesion of an ATFL where you see that the ligament is torn from the talus part and just floating into fluid. And here you can see also that the ATFL is also disrupted here and there is a part of a fatty, uh, fatty uh, uh, tissue which is inside the ATFL. So the CFL lesions, calcaneofibular uh, lesions, you can see here that the calcaneofibular, uh, calcaneofibular uh, uh, ligament is coming from the calcaneus, going over the talus and reaching the lateral malleolus. And this is now with the new, new equipment very well seen. As you see here, this is the tip of the fibula. This is the calcaneus, the talus is over there. And these are the peroneal tendons which are covering and not seen in this, uh, in this uh, dissection uh, that I own to by uh, Dr. Martinoli and Dr. Marigel. Maribel Perez in Barcelona. So this is the way you can see the uh, calcaneofibular ligament nowadays. And when you're looking to the uh, to the uh, calcaneofibular ligament, when you stress the the ankle, you can see very clearly that the peroneal tendons are pushed up are pushed up by the pushed up by the by the ligament and by the tension of the ligament. As you will see again, you will see that the ligament is pushing the peroneal tendons up towards the probe and tense, and, and this is a tense ligament from the calcaneus to the fibula. In the opposite, in the opposite, a ligament which is abnormal will not see a tension when you do the hyperextension. So the the, the, the dorsal flexion, this is hyperextension, the dorsal flexion of the foot, you can see that the ligament will not move again and will not push the peroneal tendons towards the probe. The peroneal tendons uh, stay there. This is a very good image of an abnormal CFL lesion. So I will show you now the stress maneuver that we can, uh, can I have a model now? Uh, that we can use to see the uh, the lesion of the of the ATFL, and you all know that stress varus, that stress varus looks to the CFL and the anterior drawer test looks to the ATFL. So anterior drawer test is very uh, used in radiology, but we can do it also in with ultrasound. With ultrasound. Don't forget that the ATFL has an horizontal course like this, coming from the fibula and going to the talus. And so when we will do the anterior draw test, we will see movements between the talus and the fibula. This is how we, we do when we do the, this, uh, this image in, uh, in radiography, of course, or this one, you can see that the, that the talus is going forward towards the fibula and the tibia, of course, but we are looking in ultrasound with the fibula. So what we do in ultrasound is putting the patient prone, putting the patient prone and putting his tibia on the uh, on the table. So the table, the table is doing what your hand is doing on the tibia in, uh, in x-rays. And then we pull the foot downwards and the table prevents the tibia to move and we see the movements of the, of the uh, ATFL and we see the movements of the, uh, of the fibula and the talus. This is an example of a normal ATFL. Okay, you can see that when we move the foot downwards, when we pull the foot downwards, it is in tension, it is stretching, but there is no movements between the fibula and the talus. On the opposite, in this image, for example, you can see that there is a very big movement be between the talus and the fibula because there is no ATFL between both bones. So I will show you how to do now. So can you light porn? I take 
this one. So I take a high, uh, a high frequency probe, which is big. We can also take the hockey stick probe. I put this tibia on the table. I put my probe, I will do this one so you can see a little bit better. I put my probe on the ATFL. You can see on the, on the left now, you can see the fibula, and on the right, you can see the talus. And you can see the ATFL in the middle. You can, yeah, in, uh, like this, perfect. So I hold the probe with my left hand, and I pull down, I pull down the foot, and you see that there is absolutely no movement between the two bones. There is a movement in the, in the joint, of course, at the deep level of the ATFL. You can see the fat tissue, fatty tissue of the, of the joint moving between the tibia, uh, the fibula and the, and the talus. But, but there is no movements of the talus itself compared with the fibula. Okay? So this is a normal appearance of a draw, anterior drawer test of the, of the ankle. This is what I do every time somebody is telling me that he has instability of the, of the ankle. Every time, okay? So I can find if the instability is due to the ATFL lesion or not, okay? So this is the first example that I have to show you. This is another one where you can see that the ATFL was torn and there was a heterotopic bony fragment inside the ATFL. So is this bony heterotopic uh, fragment a very, uh, a very uh, good structure for the ATFL? Is it holding the ATFL to the fibula or not? The patient is complaining from instability. So we ask her to move with our pull the foot and you see that this bony heterotopic fragment is completely loose from the fibula and uh, that there is a ATFL instability. So when you have pain after uh, a sprain, you can have occult fracture, you can have occult ligamentous lesion, you can have occult tendon lesion, you can have <coughs> anterolateral impingement, instability of the ankle, we have seen that. And you can have also traction neuropathy of the superficial pernal nerve in recurrent instability. I will show you this with the model a little bit later. But the only ex important exception that you cannot see with ultrasound is the fracture of the tailored dome. So don't forget this. This is very important to do MRI when you have a discrepancy between a normal ultrasound and pain in the ankle after a, uh, after an ankle sprain. So you can see the fracture with ultrasound. You can see without any problem the lateral part of the talus fracture. You see here the, the little fracture. This is the bony uh, version there. This is very important. It is not very well seen in X-rays. It is very well seen in coronal slides of a CT and it is also seen with ultrasound. Very important. The radiologist which is in front of his, of his patient must always ask the patient where do you feel the pain. Okay? This is our major advantage with the radiologist which is dealing with MRI or with CT. He is not in front of the patient. And after an examination where I see nothing in ultrasound, I always ask the patient did I touch the place where you are uh, w where you have pain. And then sometimes you say, um, sorry, but you didn't touch the place. Where is the place? There. And I put my, my probe there and I see the fracture of the lateral part of the talus, for example. Or I see the, the, the fracture of the anterior superior process of the calcaneus, which is very, very difficult to see in x-rays, as you know. So this is very important. We are in front of the patient. We have to discuss with the patient. Subtalar joint injury is sometimes difficult to see with ultrasound because we can, all, we can only see edema coming from the subtalar joint. And, uh, and compared with MRI, this is much more uh, uh, seen in MRI than in ultrasound. Or we can see some cysts coming from the sinus tarsi 
but sometimes, I'm sorry, we need MRI or CT to be sure. I told you about, no, I didn't tell you about the antero, anterior tibiofibular ligament lesion. This is a normal anterior tibiofibular, so tibiofibular lesion, tibiofibular ligament, I'm sorry. This is without stre stretching. This is with stretching. How do you stress this, this ligament? Do you know? We stress this ligament, I will show you, by doing a dorsal flexion of the foot. Okay? Why is it so? It's because we can see this ligament very clearly between the fibula and the tibia, like this. Okay, so this is the, the ligament there. I'm sorry, my probe is reversed. So this is the ligament. On the left, I have the fibula. On the, on the right, I have the tibia. And I see here the ligament between the tibia and the fibula. So when I do a dorsal flexion of the foot, I, uh, just, just wait, I will push the talus towards the tibia and the fibula, and it opens a little bit the gap between the tibia and the fibula. So this is what I will do. I will do it myself. And sometimes you can see a little difference. I'm sorry, I, have, I need a little bit more. Voila. So this is the without tension, and this is with tension. And you see better the ligament with tension, of course, than without. Okay? So if you don't see very clearly the ligament, don't forget to put the, to put the foot in dorsal, flexion, in dorsal flexion. So we push the talus towards the tibia and the fibula, and you see much better the lines of the anterior tibiofibular ligament. So it is a little bit more, a little bit more uh, uh, big on the tibial side than on the fibular side. You can see it's a little bit more, it's a little bit bigger on the, on, the, on the tibia than on the fibula. So if you do like this, you will say, what's in the middle there? I don't know, is it a gap, something like that? Just stress and there is no gap. Okay? Don't forget the dynamic movements when you look to a ligament. And you must know these movements. You all know that the calcaneofibular ligament is stretched when you do a dorsal flexion. That's everybody knows since 1994, something like that. But this ligament is a little bit less, less known, as you see. So the, the uh, very uh, common uh, cause of this tibiofibular ligament lesion here is the, uh, is the skier uh, injury. The skier injury, when he hits a pole with, uh, with, uh, with the, the end of a ski, then he has a torsion of the tibia and the fibula. And this is an example here with tension and without tension. So clearly abnormal compared with the normal one of this inferior tibiofibular ligament injury. So we have already discussed about the anterolateral impingement. This is an abnormal healing tissue located between the fibula and the talus. So thickening of the ligament, we have seen it. But there is also a posterior medial impingement. Posterior medial impingement is all, it's exactly the same. It is healing tissue, abnormal healing tissue, thicker than normal healing tissue, sometimes containing a ossification, a terotopic ossification in the posterior talofibula, a uh, talotibial, this one, uh, this can uh, lead to posterior impingement. For example, here, this is the tibia, this is the posterior talus, this is the healed deltoid ligament with an heterotopic bone between the tibia and the talus. And then the pain can tell you that he has an inversion pain. When he does, in when he does inversion, which is, in fact, uh, supination of the foot, you can see you can, he can have some, some pain in this part. So another thing that you have to know, uh, this is an update we are telling, we are uh, speaking about updates in ankle sonography, is the uh, involvement of the superficial peroneal nerve. So when you have recurrent ankle sprains, sometimes the reason is not in the ankle itself, it comes from above. It comes from a stretching of the superficial peroneal nerve. I don't know if you remember this nerve, it's coming from the common peroneal nerve. It is following the peroneal, the peroneal muscles and it's going away from the peroneal muscles there. So more or less 15 centimeters 
above the malarius. Then it stays under the aponeurosis of the of the of the of the, the, the leg for five centimeters more or less, and ten centimeters above the malarius, it goes <laughs> to the skin just underneath the skin. So in this portion, the, the, the nerve is just in between, just in between aponeurosis, muscle, and skin. And of course, when you have recurrent sprain of the ankle, recurrent inversion sprain of the ankle, you are pulling on this nerve a little bit, and this can lead to a little neuroma, a little neuroma at that level when the peroneal nerve is crossing the fascia, the, fascia the, the lateral fascia of the leg. This is an example of this neuroma, and I missed the image there. But you can see very clearly this nerve coming from underneath the muscle, going there, going there, going there, and be, being a little bit big at that level. So I will show you some examples with the model of this, of this nerve to show you exactly where it is. It's very easy to remember, 15 and 10 centimeters. So 15 centimeters is more or less this is more or less this, okay? 10 centimeters is more or less five fingers or seven fingers, okay? So this is 10 centimeters and this is 15 centimeters, okay? So I put my probe 15 centimeters above the malarius. Can you turn on your left side? Okay, put this here and that one there. Okay, so I put there 15 centimeters from the malleolus, okay? What I'm looking is the, the place where the, where the, uh, the peroneal muscles here, peroneal longus and bravus, okay, that you know, and the extensor muscle, extensor of the, of the toes, are close together to each other. And I'm looking just in between. I'm looking just in between and I see here this little peron superficial peroneal nerve, very easily. And you see that at that level, exactly that level, 10 centimeters above the malleolus, this, this superficial peroneal nerve is becoming subcutaneous. So subcutaneous, and you can follow it everywhere. But at that, exactly here, it is coming from the subcutaneous part of the, of the leg to the infrafacial part of the leg and then to the muscular part of the leg. Okay, and this is exactly where you will find the neuroma of this peroneal, of this superficial peroneal nerve. Okay, of course, this is a 24 megahertz probe. I think you can see it with, your, with every equipment, but not as well sometimes. But this is exactly where it is crossing the fascia. And if you see this, if you don't see anything in the ankle, don't forget that in recurrent sprain, so this is not the first sprain, it is coming after five, six, seven little dislocation, okay? The patient is just, oh, it hurts. And then, and then she says, or he says, that the pain is not precise in the ankle. It is going to the foot, to the dorsal foot. Of course, the dorsal foot is innervated by the superficial peroneal nerve. Then you have to think about looking to this. If you see a neuroma, you inject the neuroma with anesthetic first or with, with steroids to have a therapeutic test. And then the patient says, oh, I don't feel anything more. And you are the hero of, the, of, the, of your hospital, okay? Because he or she has already been injected, injected five times around the tip of the malleolus without any, any difference, okay? So, this is the superficial peroneal nerve. Don't forget to look to the tendons also. Don't forget to test the tendons, to test the tendons with an eversion maneuver. Eversion maneuver is this, so you ask the patient to uh, hyperflex dorsal flexing the, the, the foot and then to uh, pronate the foot towards the, 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 
towards the, the lateral part, and you push a little bit with your thumb on the foot, and this is the eversion maneuver to see reducible or irreducible luxations of the peroneal, nerve, peroneal tendons. This is what happens when you have a peroneal, a, a, a peroneal, brevis, peroneal brevis lesion. Don't forget this image, this is, and this one. This is a very important image, because in this case, you see that the peroneal longus tendon is much bigger than the peroneus brevis. You have to describe this is abnormally thick, but this is also abnormal. This is abnormally thin. The peroneus longus is going inside the peroneus brevis, like in this image. And then it causes a gap between the peroneus brevis and the malleolus. So this, is, this gap is very important to, to describe. In this example, for example, for, for example, you can see that the peroneus brevis is turning around the peroneus longus. This is what you can see when peroneus brevis is about to, to, uh, to, be, torn, to be torn with a longitudinal cleft. So don't forget this boomerang, this boomerang image or the circular image of the peroneus brevis around the peroneus longus, which is abnormal in every case. This is an example here that you can see in this short video. So peroneus longus is on the top, peroneus brevis is here, and you can see that peroneus longus is going inside, and then after you see the cleft inside, just in submalleolar space, you see the cleft inside the peroneus brevis. So the cleft is about to come when you see these, these lesions of the peroneus brevis. Subluxation. I told you, you have to do the eversion maneuver and you try to find that some tendon, one or two or both, can go between the skin and the fibula. Normally it's not like this. And in some cases you have the, you can see, I'm sorry, you can see the something very special. You can see here the peroneus bravis and you see a bony structure there. I don't know if you know what it is. It is a fracture, it is a bone chip coming from the fibula and the retinaculum of the peroneal tendons are just uh, avals from the, from the tip of the fibula. This is another example where you can see this little fracture of the fibula and the peroneal tendons are going in between the fracture and the fibula. So this is a very important lesion. This must be <coughs> treated with uh, uh, more than, than a, a simple uh, band over the, of the ankle because this is a, a cause of recurrent lesions, recurrent dislocation of the peroneus tendon. Something that is not very well known is the retromalleolar click. So what happens? The patient comes and says, I, see, I have some pain and I, I heard or I see or, I, or I, uh, I, um, I feel a click when I do some movements. So I ask her to do these movements and try to find what happens. First of all, in this, uh, in this um, uh, picture, you can see that the retinaculum of the peroneal tendons is much bigger than normal much bigger than normal. Normally you have a, f a very fine line with a, f a little triangle here. In this case you don't have this. You have the peroneus brevis and the peroneus longus tendon together and what you'll see uh, when the patient is asking to do the, the click is that the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis are turning around each other. So no longus is there and brevis is there. And you can see it again, once again. And she feels the click, and in your, in your hand with the probe, you can feel a click also when the tendons are going on the other side. Okay? This is the interperoneal dislocation. This is not so rare. You have to ask the patient to do this maneuver. Let's go to the medial ankle pathology. Medial ankle pathology is a little bit more difficult. I will show you some examples with the models. You have, in fact, five different, five different uh, ligaments there. The tibiotalar, posterior, very deep, very thick. 
the tibio calcaneer, intermediate, superficial, the tibio tailor, anterior tibio tailor, and the tibio navicular, which is anterior, very thin, very difficult to see. And then you have also the sprint ligament, which we'll, we will we'll discuss a little bit later. So if you look to this drawing, it was just coming from Carlo Martinoli, you have the very thick, very thick posterior tibio talus ligament. You have the intermediate, which is a little bit thinner, tibiocalcanear ligament. And then you have the anterior part, which is thin and very superficial between the tibia and the navicular and the tibia and the talus. Okay? What is very important is that the tibialis posterior tendon is just covering all these ligaments. So if you look to the the tibialis posterior, you will see a little bit better these two ligaments. You will not see this one, and I will show you how to see. But first of all, I will show you some example of the, of the, the lesion. This is, this is the posterior part of the tibio talar deltoid ligament, so coming from the tibia and going to the talus with the posterior tibial tendon just above. This is a uh, tibio uh, calcaneo ligament, which was here the cystentaculum tali, and this very big ligament instead of a normal one. And this is the anterior part of the deltoid ligament from the tibia to the anterior part of the talus and the navicular. And you can see that there is a bump here. There is a stump here of the anterior deltoid ligament with no ligament coming from this to the talus. So this is a little bit tricky. I will show you how to do. So don't forget that all these ligaments are stressed in... Give me... Uh, turn on your, or your right side. Are stressed in some different position. What is the stretching position for the posterior tibio talar ligament? Do you know? You have to open the gate between the tibia and the talus. How to open the gate? Is it doing this or doing that? Okay? So opening the gate is, of course, doing that. Because the talus is here and the tibia is there. And if I close the gate, I close the, uh, the, 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 two, uh, the, the two bones are close together. So I put my probe on the tibia and I'm looking to the talus. Okay? So here is the tibia, here is the posterior tibial tendon, here is the talus. And you say, oh, he has a very big deltoid ligament lesion here because this is normal and then suddenly it goes completely black to the, to the bottom of the image. But if I do this, I stretch the ligament, and you see that there is no gap at all. The ligament is complete, and it has no lesion of the deltoid ligament. Okay? So very important. Stretching position and non-stretching position. The tibia and the talus are close to each other. The tibia and the talus are far from each other. And when they are far from each other, you can see this posterior part of the deltoid ligament very clearly. Okay? So this is very important. You have to think before doing your ultrasound. If you do like this, you'll say, oh, this patient has a stump here on the deltoid li ligament. The deltoid ligament is not going to the talus. In fact, the deltoid ligament is doing like this. It's coming here, going there, going there, going there, and going here, okay? And when you open the gate, open the gap, you see exactly what I told you. The deltoid ligament is normal. It is exactly the same for the anterior part of the deltoid ligament, okay? So when you are looking to the tibio -taylor, anterior tibio -taylor or tibio navicular ligament, what is the good position? Is it like this? Or like that? Of course it's like that, okay? Because you open the gap between the navicular bone and the tibia. So if you want to see these tibio, uh, the anterior tibio talar ligament, you have to open the gap between the tibia and the talus. So here is the talus, okay? Anterior part of the talus. Here is the tibia. 
and you can see and you can see when he opens the gap you can see a little bit of the anterior tib uh, tibiotalar ligament which is coming from here and going there going there going there going there going there it's a very very thin ligament very thin here going to the anterior talus exactly there you know that this is the cartilage of the talus okay everybody knows that there is no ligament inserting on cartilage, okay? So you don't have to look here. You have to look just after the end of the cartilage. It's always there that a ligament is going. So this is the little, little anterior part of the deltoid ligament. It is inserting on the beak of the talus just after the cartilage, okay? If you do the reverse position, impossible to see. If you dorsal flex, impossible to see. It is, however, very difficult to see when you have the good position, but it's clearly impossible to see when you have the bad position. Okay? So it is not the fault of your equipment. It is the fault of your brain. Okay? I will end with the... This, these are images that we can see now with uh, tendon lesions. You can see very clearly little clefts inside the tendon, little holes inside the tendon, little holes and clefts inside the tendon. This is all tibialis posterior. And you can see with the microvascular imaging, you can see hypervascular uh, imaging of the tendon, which is clearly abnormal. This is this one, I think. I'm not sure, but this, uh, it looks like. And you can see hypervascularization. This hypervascularization is very important. I will go to, some, to the end. It's now 40, yes, 45. And I'll show you what is now important also to do when you have, when you have a tendon lesion. So you have dynamic imaging and microvascularization imaging. Dynamic imaging tells you what happens in these four Achilles tendons. Okay, in this tendon you see here little liquid between the calcaneus bone and something. You see a gap in the calcaneus bone. In this you see liquid here and holes in the Achilles tendon. Here you see li liquid and holes in the Achilles tendon. And here you see liquid in the retrocalcanear bursa. Okay? What is the tendon which is, or where, what are the tendons which are completely destroyed? This one? This one? This one? Or this one? This one doesn't look to have some abnormality. Okay? Look to the dynamic imaging of this one. Uh, no, that one. I mean. Okay, I moved the I moved the 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 foot, and you see that this is not moving at all. Or if, in fact, it is moving at the other side. It is moving on the other side. You can see that when the ankle is going there, the tendon is going that way. So there is no tendon at all on the calcaneus. No tendon at all on the calcaneus. This is very important to tell the surgeon because he has to fix the tendon to the calcaneus. He doesn't have to repair the tendon. He has to fix the tendon to the calcaneus. There is no tendon on the calcaneus. On this other example, you can see that this is moving with the, with the foot, this is not moving with the foot. So you can exactly measure where are the two stumps of the, of the tendon. You can exactly measure where are the two parts of the tendon. One part is there and the other part is there. And you can measure and tell the, uh, tell the surgeon that he has maybe two centimeters between the two parts of the tendon. What happens with this? Is it exactly the same of this? Let's have a look. When I move the ankle, everything is moving. The proximal part of the tendon is moving. The distal part of the tendon is moving. So this tendon, which has been seen six weeks after the injury, is already in the phase of healing. 
you must not send this tendon to the surgeon. It will heal a little bit slower, but it will heal without any problem. And what happens with this? You see, this was coming to me for injection of steroids in the retrocalcanea bursa. So I tried, I asked the patient to do the, to move his, his ankle. Oh, it's not, not uh, going. No. I'm sorry. I'll try to go back here and have a look if it moves. No. Okay, so I advise you to come at four o'clock in the in the M five room. I have the same picture there and I hope it will work. So maybe in my video clip no. But let's go back to this. And you will see that uh, there is, in fact, a movement. There is, in fact, movement. Can I go back? There is, in fact, a cleft inside the tendon here. There is a cleft inside the tendon, which shows you that it is not a good idea. It is not a very good idea to inject this because you will go. The, the steroid will go inside the tendon there inside the tendon there. And the last picture that I will show you is the picture of the uh, microvascularization. Microvascularization is very important when you have tendinopathy to, tells you, to tell you if the tendinopathy is active or not. But don't forget that the, p the position of the, of the foot is very important. If you, do micro, if you do microvascular imaging with the foot in tension, with this ankle in tension, you will not see any, uh, any vessels inside, inside the tendon. And when you are looking to the Achilles tendon, normally you ask the patient to do a little bit of, of, of dorsal flexion of the foot to stretch the tendon. If you push, just push on the microvascular Doppler uh, button and you don't Remember that the foot is in dorsal flexion. You will see this. Nothing inside the tendon. No, nothing. And then suddenly you remember and you ask the patient to move to, move to plantar flexion or to relax and you see the microvascular imaging in, in, the, in the tendon. So this is the end of the workshop. I thank you very much for your attention.